Good morning and happy Easter. Christ is risen, is risen indeed. That's the proclamation that will go out through the world this weekend as Christians in churches everywhere gather to celebrate Easter, the stories of resurrection. Having journeyed through Lent, barren time, the wilderness of Lent, with dark and purple colours, with subdued music, they'll break out in joy with gold and, and white colours with hallelujahs and songs of praise on organs, on guitars and basses and drums, singing triumphal songs of joy and hope, telling stories of resurrection, of new life out of death. This is Easter. And Easter comes to us each time, each year at this time. Easter. But, but what does it mean in our lives and where do, we, where do we experience it? How do we understand it in the midst of our lives, in the midst of the life of our world with all its struggles and challenges, pain and sorrow? The stories of Easter, of that first Easter morning in the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the stories of Jesus in the New Testament, each begin in the pre-dawn darkness. The darkness before the day begins, this first day of the week. And it starts with women, faithful women, women who push down on their fear and anguish and venture out into the world, outside the, the locked doors and the solid walls of the room that contains the disciples and followers of Jesus, filled with fear, fear that those enemies of Jesus that had him killed would come after them filled with fear and anguish and grief and pain and sorrow and wondering what will be. The women go out to prepare his body. Well, in Matthew, Mark and Luke's stories, they go to prepare his body for burial with, with herbs and spices and wrappings. But in John's story of Jesus, it's just one woman, Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. Mary, who's experienced grace in this one Jesus, who has experienced love and life and hope and peace, new life. In, in him, she has been accepted. Her life means something. In him, she experienced one who knows, who sees into her and knows and loves. And in him, there is this presence of spirit of God and the acceptance of God, that she is a child of God. A woman in a patriarchal society, she's treated as an equal and she's loved. And now, now, her friend, this saviour, I guess, this healer, this one who has received her, is dead and lying in a tomb. Lying in a tomb that is hewed out of stone. A tomb that symbolises her grief, her pain. It contains his body, but it contains her pain, her anguish, her grief, her bewilderment, her confusion, her powerlessness, her vulnerability. And she stumbles through this darkness. The darkness in John symbolises the darkness of our lives, the shadow lands of life, where, where all we see are shadows and fear and uncertainty and confusion. The, the, the shadow lands of our lives that that we don't know what to do, where, where there is grief, where, where relationships are broken down. It, it's, it's the place where the parents sit in a hospital room holding their child that moves between life and death. It, it, it's the bedside where, where friends and family gathered round the one whose life is slipping away. In the words of John Donne, as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, some of their dear friends who say his breath goes now and some say no. This, this waiting for death to come, this lonely journey that happens to each of us. It, it's the place where we feel lost, where our dreams and our hopes disappear and we don't know what will emerge in their place. It's a place where we have no control, where the control we think we've had over life is gone. 
It's in this darkness of pre-dawn morning where Easter begins. It's in the darkness of our lives. It's in where the pain touches us, where life is hard and harsh, where we don't know what we're doing, where the doubts and questions and fears fill our lives and our being, and we don't know our way ahead. And our souls cry out in that dark night of the soul, in, in, in those dark hours of night, crying out in anguish, what now, what now, what next, what will I do? How will we live? What's it all about? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm lost, I'm afraid. It, it, it's when our souls yearn for the hope and the life that we pray will be there. It's the, it's, the, it's the addict, drug addict, alcoholic, who goes to a 12 steps program and is confronted with this community of people at all the different stages. People getting up and saying, I've got a problem and I don't know what to do. It's uncontrollable and it's messing my life and I don't know what to do. I can't fix myself. And the others applaud and say, yeah, that's right. Keep going. I need help. I need to reach out for the higher power, the power that comes from beyond, the power that we call God, Spirit, the risen Christ. I need help. And I need the community around me, the community who understands and accepts and loves, who lifts me up when I fall, the, the, the people I can support along the way, along the journey. That's Easter. And when the person discovers that they can't do it for themselves and makes that admission, when, when we recognise our vulnerability and our helplessness, our, our lack of control, and own it, Easter can begin. And as Mary stumbles through the darkness to the tomb, and here I am at before Doug's painting again, which, which reminds me of that, that cave or that tomb-like space. And, and that tomb holds for Mary her grief, her pain, the body of Jesus. When she gets closer, stumbling in the darkness, her darkness of grief and sadness, she notices that the tomb is open. There's a, there's, there's a stone rolled away and the tomb is open. And, and she doesn't look in, but she imagines someone's been and taken the body. And she runs to tell the disciples and a couple of them, Peter and another one, come and they run in and they see and they believe. But what do they believe? That his body's been taken. And they tell the disciples and this room of anguish is further confused and disoriented and lost. But Mary stays, stays with the tomb. She stays before the tomb and she herself goes in, goes into the place that, that holds her grief and her pain. She enters into the darkness that's the deepest darkness and she goes in and there's nothing there. There's a couple of strange figures and a couple of voices. Why are you weeping, woman? Why indeed? And she turns around and there's another figure. Is it the gardener? Who can tell in this darkness? And that voice says, are you weeping? Why? Have you taken his body? Where is, where is the one that's supposed to be in the tomb? Have you got him? Can I have him? I want to replace, put him back and, and prepare his body. And the figure says, Mary. And she looks and sees and her eyes are open and she recognises and she goes to, to grasp. But she's warned off, no, don't hold me. Don't cling, let go. Go and tell the disciples that you've seen me, I'm risen. I'm here in the world in a new way. I'm with you. That's what Easter's about. And these stories of, of resurrection, of, of Easter, 
are witnesses to the experience of this risen Christ who is experienced in profound mystery and wondrous ways. For Paul, it's a, it's a light and a voice that comes to him. And then he begins a process of change and transformation. Easter and resurrection comes and he discovers a new way, a new life. It's grounded in love, not, not law and judgment, but love. There's a story of John Newton, um, the, the evangelical preacher, who was also a slave trader. When he was a young child, he, he, his mother sat him on her, her knee and read scripture stories, Bible stories, and prayed with him. And then she died when he was still very young, six years old or something like that. His father was out at sea often, and so he was shipped around relatives until at a younger age, 11, 12, he himself went out to sea on the ships and gradually moved up through the ranks, learned the trade, he learned the craft of seamanship and other things of the culture. He became a, a wise and, and strong captain, I guess, the captain of a, of a, of a slave ship, slave trader. His life descended into chaos with drinking and abuse and fighting and he got himself into a mess and he was gradually demoted away from captain. He was just one of the people on the ship and, and only just held on to that position. And one day, his last, his last journey in a ship, the ship was caught in a, in a massive cyclone and the waves and the wind belted the side of the ship and it broke through and, and, and the ship was in trouble and it was all hands on deck to bail the water out and repair the ship. And so there was rosters of, where sailors could, could have just a couple of hours of sleep and then it was back to work. And Newton was in his room in his cabin, lying on his bunk. He couldn't sleep because he was, he was scared, afraid, this man of the sea, because he knew he was going to die. There was no way they could make it through this, this wind and the waves. And, and in his fear and anguish and, and utter despair, he remembered being on his mother's knee and praying. And he got down and he prayed to a God he'd not thought of for many a year. And he offered himself and begged for mercy. And he said that when he, when he opened his eyes, it was as if the cabin was a light. And he knew, he knew in his being that he'd be all right. He still believed he was going to die but he knew he would be okay because he was loved. He was known and he was loved and this God would hold him. Anyway, the captain of that ship was an incredibly clever and courageous man and managed to get the ship through the storm and hobbled back into port and everyone was saved. And Newton left the ship and he left sea life and he went and trained as a, as a minister and he dedicated his life to sharing this grace. And then he worked with William Wilberforce to overcome slavery, to abolish slavery. He wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace. I was lost, but now I'm found, blind, but now I'm see, I see. He, he, was a, he was dead, but became alive. He, he had to let go, and it was in his anguish and the darkness in the dark moment that Easter came. And it comes to us in those moments when we let go and we trust. We trust in that, that thing we can't see. We enter into the, the mystery and the wonder and walk through. Walk through and this veil that we see of the red and the dark is lifted up and new life emerges. This, 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 this bright light that bursts through, this. I love this little bit of light that comes through and reminds me that the light of Christ is shining and radiating even in the deepest darkness and comes to us. And that's Easter. And when we see Easter, it opens our eyes. It's, it, it's the green shoots that appear after a bushfire that remind us that life comes out of the death and the dying. Life, new life, the wonder of life. That's Easter. And we're invited to participate in it when all looks lost and everything looks bad and grim. Christ is with us. 
the spirit of the living God is with us and holds us. Easter is there for each of us. Now and always. Amen.